Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at PureMTGO.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. How's it going, everybody? It is 12 o'clock, September, Friday, September 25th, 2020, and it's time for this week's edition of the the Homeward Path, and if you don't know what the Homeward Path is, then I've got some questions for you. Are you a fan of Magic the Gathering? Obviously so, I guess, since you're here, right? But is there something in your everyday life that takes precedence over Magic? Something like a partner, children, grueling job or career, any combination of those things. Are you still doing your best to improve at magic despite all these outside distractions? Well, if that's the case, then I guess I don't have to worry about your sideboard plan because you don't have any hate for me. So together, let's look at the three B's of self-improvement in this situation in magic budgeting brewing and breaking bad habits but first let's get the shilling out of the way so i can continue improving this show we are sponsored by puremtgo.com one of the largest repositories of magic content on the web their sponsor is mtgotraders.com if you consider if you have ever considered getting into magic online rather than arena or paper magic Go to MTGO Traders. They are so nice to work with. Just utterly fantastic to work with. Prices are transparent. It's just the the whole experience is a net positive. Um, And, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the parent network. People that make it possible for us to be here in the first place in constructedcriticism.com. There's, you know, I love the people that I'm a part of a network with and you should check out all of the content on the network and while you're browsing the web for all of these other sponsor things if you feel like you want to support me in a more direct fashion head over to patreon.com slash homewardpathmtg this show is always going to be free but if you like what i'm doing enough to help me keep doing it in order and enough to help me make it better head on over there And I will make sure your voice is heard through this show. And with that out of the way, let's dive into our first segment every week. We have Budget Spotlight, where we normally spotlight an uncommon, a rare, and a mythic every week on the show. This week we don't have a mythic. But it's cards that I feel are cheap, way cheaper than they should be. Uh, First of all, we don't have a single card so much as we have an entire cycle of cards courtesy of they just rotated out of standard like today in paper but I mean in paper they've been like borderline forcibly rotated since February since we couldn't play in paper anyway but we've got the Aethergust cycle I like to call it the the color hosers from Corset 2020 so for those of you who don't know, they are cards that interact in interact with different types of cards of two opposing colors. So you have Fry that interacts with red with uh, blue or white creatures or planeswalkers. Deals five damage, it can't be countered. You have uh, Aethergust, which deals with red or green spells or permanents. Puts them on top of the deck or bottom, the opponent's choice. You have Devout Decree that exiles black or red creatures or planeswalkers, and it's one and a white. Thankfully, they all cost two mana, too. It's just such a clean cycle. Oh, right, then there's Veil of Summer. We don't want to talk about Veil of Summer. As far as magic is concerned, that, that card doesn't exist anymore. It's just not a thing. Nobody is remotely interested in it. <laughs> I mean we're we're all interested in it we just we're not allowed to play it so 
really doesn't matter. <laughs> but regarding this cycle and even like the, the color hoser cycle from Throne of Eldraine that are color hosers for themselves or they're hosers against their own color. Cards like Red Cap Melee, to a lesser extent, stuff like Specter Shriek or OK My Adversary or um God, I can't remember what the, the white one is. Actively don't remember if there's a white one. Is that horrible? It feels like it should be horrible. But like Spectre Shriek, Mystical Dispute, Red Cat Melee. Okay, my adversary is a card that exists. You know. It's not exciting, but it's it's there. They're they're effective color hosers in the sense that they are efficient spells that deal with a wide range of things. The other neat thing about all of them is all of them are under a dollar and most of them I would wager are under 50 cents. So they are fantastic tools to pick up for sideboard plans in Pioneer and to a lesser extent in stuff like Standard or Modern. I mean, 50 cents ain't bad. <laughs> but it's a, they're, not only are they just effective sideboard cards in general, they're effective against a wide array of decks. A card like Red Cat Melee is effective against Mono Red Aggro, Racto Sacrifice, Winota, the Young Pyromancer decks. Like, it, it's a card that deals with red creatures very effectively and it doesn't really care if those red creatures happen to have another color on them and moreover they're also great in conjunction with a series of cards we've talked about on this show before in the wishes whether they be fey of wishes Karn the great creator or masterminds acquisition they are great targets for like fey of wishes and Masterminds acquisition because for four mana you can just go get a thing and on turn six you can four mana go get a thing and deal with a thing. Just efficiently answer the question your opponent is posing. That's a pretty good place to be. So just like they're not sexy, they're not exciting, but they're very good at what they do. Sorry, was taking a drink. The second card on the list is our first rare, and I cannot for the life of me figure out how in the world this card is only 75 cents. It is Kunaros Hound of Athreos. It is one, a black and a white, for a 3-3 Vigilance Lifelink Menace. And it is a card that says, creatures can't enter the battlefield from graveyards and spells can't be cast from graveyards. Elegant, simple, to the point. So, not only is it an effective graveyard hate piece, not only is it, like, a, it's an okay rate creature, 3 mana, 3-3. Three, three. Oh, but by the way, it also just has a ton of words on it. You know, Vigilance, Menace, Lifelink. And shut down your graveyard. There's not a lot more you can ask from a utility 3-drop in a black-white deck. Like, because Lifelink gives it that little bit of anti-aggro that your black-white creature decks typically want to have. And then when you toss in, making it difficult to block and capable of attacking and blocking at the same time. It's just a really, really good card. Now, granted, the color combo is somewhat restrictive, but as I, as I said, it's a really good example of what I call... The, the theory of the power of lots of words. It has a lot of words on it, so it's probably pretty good. And last but not least, I want to talk about one. It's $5. It's, it's into what would normally be our Mythic price range, which is why I didn't do it Mythic this week. But it is a card I firmly believe should be in everybody's toolkit if they're looking at playing Eternal Formats. And that card is Graph Digger's Cage. Just like the Aether Gust Cycle, first of all, it's just a fantastic wish target. At five mana, you can do a lot worse against a graveyard deck than Fey of Wishes or Karn or Masterminds Acquisition for Cage 
to keep them from gaining any more forward momentum. Those of you who don't know what it does, it is one mana artifact. Players can't, or creatures can't enter the battlefield from libraries or graveyards, and spells cannot be cast from libraries or graveyards. That's, that's really hateful. That is, that is, that is a card that knows exactly what it doesn't want you to do. And I am here for it. It can shut down entire archetypes. Like, this thing shuts down the sacrifice archetype in Pioneer. Just by existing on the battlefield, their deck does not get to play magic the way they want to. Because both halves of their deck are built around things that Gravedigger's Cage shuts off. They either want to ramp into a quick Bolus' Citadel, resolve a bunch of permanents, and then sacrifice them to kill you, or they want to start looping Cauldron Familiar through Witch's Oven with Mayhem Devil on the battlefield and generate a bunch of sacrifice triggers. Guess what you can't do either of with this thing on the table? It's those things. That, that, that's what you can't do. As such, because it is so singularly powerful and comes down so early, it demands an answer from the other side of the table. And when you demand an answer from the other side of the table, and you take away the ability to find it out of the library or pull it back out of the graveyard for value off a discard effect, You force your opponents to play cards like Reclamation Sage. You force your opponents to play cards like uh, Smash to Smithereens. You force them to play cards that are worse than the cards they would otherwise be playing because they don't, they have to be able to deal with this thing. They have to blow this up or they don't get to play Magic. And then if the format constraints dictate it, this card's good in the main deck, too. I would argue one of the best places to be on a budget if you're looking to get into Historic and, to a lesser extent, Pioneer. Mono Blue Tempo with main deck Cage doesn't sound horrible. First of all, it gives you four cards that are really easy to slot out when the card's not, not applicable to the matchup. But moreover, you look at those formats... We've got the the Dredgeless Dredge deck that's starting to pop up in Pioneer. We've got the the Bolas' Citadel decks in Pioneer. We've got Uro decks, Uro piles in both formats. We've got just a litany of cards that care about coming out of the graveyard, but also Bolas' Citadel, Experimental Frenzy, um... Vizier of the Menagerie to a much less less of an extent. But, you know, card collected company. Cards that want to put creatures into play from the deck. Or cast spells from the deck. It's really good. Really, really good to be able to shut those things down. And by virtue of playing that as your de facto one drop, like, there's a lot less the format can do to you that you have to use counter spells for. So that's another win-win. And if, you know, the idea of making sure your opponent doesn't do anything too threatening whatsoever ever sounds appealing to you, you're going to love this week's Brew of the Week. Brew of the Week is where I either highlight a deck that spotlights what I'm looking at for the budget spotlight in the main segment, or we take a look at a patron's deck. Now this week, it's one that fits with the other two things. I didn't get any patron submissions this week, despite trying, and I really need more of them. I need you guys, I, I, I need y'all to come in here. I need y'all to talk to me. Talk to me, tell me what you want. But this week's brew is, again, more of an abstract concept, but it feels like something that has some legs. Or tentacles, as the case may be, because we're going to be talking about Eldrazi and Taxes as it relates to Pioneer. Now, you think Eldrazi and Taxes in black-white, you think 
modern because you get Thoughtseize, you get Thalia, you get uh, Flicker Wisp, you get, you know, a lot of these very, very powerful, eternally playable, hateful, hateful magic cards. Well, Eldrazi and Taxes and Pioneer is a little bit of a different animal or tentacle monster. The basic premise behind it being you want to combine disruption elements, cards like Thoughtseize. You still have Thoughtseize and Pioneer. But even cards like Kite Sail Freebooter, you know, the, the kind of mopey seeming two drop creatures that disrupt your opponent's plan, those are pretty good here. Those are those are those are solid magic cards here. But you combine powerful hate cards with removal and discard. In this case, your hate cards that you have access to in Pioneer, you have Thalia, Heretic, Cathar, uh, three mana, three two. Your opponent's lands or non-basic lands and creatures enter the battlefield tapped. That shuts off most of the decks in Pioneer, because most of you in Pioneer have. Shockland driven, Shockland, Shockland, now Flipland driven mana bases. None of those are basics. So, forcing you on your fundamental turns, your turn four, turn five, to take time off is really valuable. Forcing your creatures that you need to resolve in order to block with to enter the battlefield tapped, kind of a big deal with a few exceptions like Winota doesn't care about entering the battlefield town but I digress that's what your that's what your graph diggers cages are for you can also sideboard from a more generalized build like you would normally have in the main deck to a much more specialized build and really just tighten the screws down on them It's, it's the kind of deck you play when your goal in playing Magic is to make your opponent as miserable as possible. And, I mean, you do you. Everybody enjoys the game in different ways. Sometimes the way you enjoy the game is making sure they don't. So, I can't, I can't argue with it. The, the second, you know, in addition to all this disruption, it has, it has speed. It has a clock to it. Thought Not Seer, Matter Reshaper, and uh, Reality Smasher. I mean, what else is there to say about the Eldrazi Stompy terrorizing threesome? That, that doesn't that doesn't roll off the tongue right. Uh, but they're they're a really good top end Smasher. After you know you disrupt them on one, disrupt them on two. Reshaper, thought not, disrupt him again, smasher, get to work. Like, let's just get this thing over with. And then you have access to powerful sideboard threats because you're in the right colors, you're playing black and white, whether it's Kunaros or Baneslayer Angel slash Lyra Dawnbringer or, you know, any of a number, Gideon of the Trials. Gideon Blackblade, whatever. Any of a litany of powerful sideboard threats you can get into to help slam the door against aggro decks where your core strategy of disruption is maybe not as good. And then you get value. Because Eldrazi Displacer combos brilliantly with a card like Kite Sail Freebooter, or obviously Thought Not Seer, uh, you can shut off your own Kunaros during your turn, put an ability on the stack, and then blink your Kunaros in response. I guess it wouldn't do that. That doesn't work. I don't know what I'm talking about. Because Displacer returns it immediately. There is no window. Don't ignore that last part. But. Eldrazi Displacer can 
also, in addition to being able to, like, give your opponent back a card that doesn't matter anymore while taking one that does, you know, in their draw step, while being able to, you know, thought not them repeatedly, being able to blink to save your creature from removal, being able to blink to tap down theirs that they were planning to block with. It's just got a lot of value strapped to it. And then by virtue of the need for colorless sources, you need to have enough colorless specific sources, you end up getting a lot of spell lands in your deck that you otherwise wouldn't. A really good example, like, obviously you're going to play Caves of Koilos, but there's also some other ones you gain access to. You get access to If Near Deadlands. It's the Black Desert. It makes a colorless. It makes a black for one life. And for two and double black, you can sacrifice it to put two minus one minus one counters on a creature. You you probably want to play a number of Field of Ruin. Because it can, you know, snipe down opposing copies of Ezcanta the Sunken Ruin. Or just do a lot of work. It's a good card. Works here because you can you can benefit from your mana base actively benefits from having the land side of it. And it can snipe off and go find a waste. That's pretty good. So overall, like it's it's the kind of deck that is going to reward format mastery. You're gonna have you're gonna want to have it built correctly. But it's the kind of deck that really can go a long way in a format like Pioneer that is kind of wide open. If you can just dictate, like, the kinds of things nobody's allowed to do, you're dictating the terms of engagement. Now your opponent's forced to play your game. And if they're not, then they're probably going to win. But when we're talking about hate cards, that's what I wanted to talk about for our main topic this week. What makes a good hate card? For me, all good hate cards are three things. Cheap. And I don't just mean dollar amount. I mean mana cost. Because if your hate card costs too much mana, you will not get to cast it before you die. The damage can already be done before that card comes down. It needs to be versatile applicable to a wide array of matchups, shut off a fundamental resource rather than just trade card for card repeatedly, and it needs to be as asymmetric as possible. When you reach for a hate card, you don't want it to hurt you too. Like, you're not going to play Graph Digger's Cage in the sideboard of your Wynota deck. It's a bad idea. But you might play Leyline of the Void. Because that doesn't do anything to you. You might play Rest in Peace. Because that doesn't do anything to you. So, how do you pick the right one? Well, first off, what do I stone cold lose to? Like, what do I just die to? No matter whether or not my deck works. That's the first question you gotta ask. Because if you don't know what you have to be, you can't hate it out. It's important to be honest in this evaluation. You cannot, as a as a Rat Ghost Pyromancer player in Modern, you cannot expect to beat Affinity because you're playing Colagon's Command. I'm sorry. I know it's a two for one, and it's cute, and it does a lot of stuff your deck likes. You know, it's an instant buys back Young Pyromancer, can buy back the Luris that died. Like, it's a good magic card, don't get me wrong. But it is not going to win your affinity matchup by itself. It is not going to win your Urza matchup by itself. It's just not. There's no way. So, the next question to ask, once you know what you've got to beat, how many sideboard slots do I have? Because if you don't have a lot of room, that means the effects you choose to play need to be more powerful. The less room you have, 
the more you need to stretch the abilities of the cards that you do choose to play. And sometimes you just have to cut bait, especially in a format like Modern, and to a lesser extent, formats like Pioneer and Pauper, where there are so many viable decks that if you just stone cold lose to one, you may just you may just not have the room to be able to fix it. You may just have to eat that one. But by and large, the first two questions are what you need to ask yourself. What do I lose to, and how much room do I have to try to fix it? Because if you have a lot of room to try to fix it, and what you're losing to is in a more general sense, like a full-on archetype, like if you're soft to aggro but you beat up on mid-range and control, well, you don't need to have like four unreasonably powerful anti-aggro sideboard cards when you can just play like a five or six card removal package that you can go into that helps shore up the problems you're having. Maybe a life gain threat or two to help slam the door that also have a little bit of range. But like when it comes to choosing the right hate cards, like losing to aggro is not the same as losing to dredge. Losing to Dredge means your removal's bad anyway, because you kill their creature and then they play a land and all of them come back. You need Graveyard Hate, you need Cage, you need whatever. You don't need Colagon's Command for Dredge. That doesn't fix your Dredge matchup. You need Cage, you need Leyline, you need, you know, You've got to shut the graveyard down, and when you start looking at it through the context of the format, there's quite a few graveyard decks, so four ley lines make sense. The last question to ask, and most important, does this weaken my deck? The better way to ask that question is how many main deck slots do I have? What are, how many flex slots do I have in my main deck? Because if I don't have enough flex slots, that's going to dictate how many and how powerful I choose for my eight cards as well. If I've only got three flex slots, those things better come in and I'm going to mull aggressively till I find them. Because if I do, I'm probably going to win. You find Leyline of the Void against uh, Cycling? Against God Pharaoh's Gift decks? Yep, that'll get you there. But if you're not expecting to run into that, maybe you don't play those as your hedge. If you're not expecting to run into the, the dredgeless, dredge, dredgeless dredge decks, you know, you may have to take some L's and just play cage if it doesn't interfere with what you're doing so that you can have something that lines up a little bit better against the field. Because it can shut off a wider array of things. You get more mileage out of your slots. And, you know, whether it's not having a lot of main deck room or not having a lot of room in the sideboard, that's pretty important to maximize the value of the cards you're playing. Now, when do you main deck hate cards? When format constraints line up just right, you look at how ver how powerful Aethergust was while it was in standard. It was basically counterspell and plow under some percentage of the time. Like it was so good because the best things to be doing in standard the whole time it was in standard were red or green in some capacity. Or when you have other synergy to prop up your fail state. You look at a card like Spreading Seas in Modern. That is a mana denial. That is a, a mana fixing hate card. But when you play Merfolk, you're totally fine playing a mana fixing hate card that also makes all your creatures unblockable. You look at Meddling Mage and Thalia in Humans. Meddling Mage and Thalia are great magic cards at hating out what they need to hate out. Meddling Mage says, no, you don't get to play that card. Thalia says, no, no storm combos for you without a lot of math that you weren't expecting to do. 
So like add one to all your math and throw it all out the window. Well, you play those cards in humans because they incidentally will disrupt your opponent while you make them bigger and beat your opponent to death. So not only are you making it difficult for them to play magic, but you're killing them. And then like a card like uh, Scavenging Ooze in your green-black X mid-range decks in Pioneer or even to a lesser extent now Standard. Like green-black X, you really want to put a bunch of stuff in their graveyard little by little. One or two cards at a time. So Scavenging Ooze can eat their graveyard while you're beating them down, while you're disrupting them, while you're killing their stuff. And then when you don't have better options in a format that is thoroughly under the thumb of an oppressor. Think Flash Freeze in Alora's Indicar Standard or Leyline of the Void and Rest in Peace during Hogak Summer. Sometimes you don't have a better option. You know, Flash Freeze and Alara's Endicar Standard was a necessary evil because we just didn't have good counter spells. We didn't have Mana Leak. We didn't have Remand. We didn't have Rune Snag. We had Cancel. And we had Essence Scatter and Negate. That was it. And Jund was the best deck in Standard with its putrid leeches and bolts and maelstrom pulses and blood braid elves and broodmate dragons and oh flash freeze counters all of that because they're all red or green for two mana leyline and rest in peace you you had to play them like you you had to play those cards you had to play them if you were going to try to fight them without playing their deck or even when you were playing their deck like, if you were the Hogak deck that opened light line, you probably won that matchup a good percentage of the time. Because you would get to go do your thing while they did not. And last but not least, I want to talk about the types of hate cards to avoid. And I have these lumped under the first one I ever actually dealt with, and I call them cranial extraction effects. In particular, the ones that cost four mana and up, but even, you know, with an honorable mention... To cards like Surgical Extraction and Unmoored Ego and the like. If you cannot wish for these, or if you are not using these in conjunction with dis with uh, discard effects to effectively strip your opponent of their ability to kill you, this is not good enough. They cost too much, and they don't impact the board. And you had to cut something from your deck in order to play them. It's not good. You have cards that don't do enough. Cards like Okame Adversary. Out of the Eldraine cycle. It's a... It's it's a Death Touch creature for two mana. That's, that's not a really effective green hoser in a world where it can't even block the questing beast it was designed to beat. In a world where it... Uh, where, where opponents have access to fight cards that will just knock it off the table. A card like Unchained Berserker that's supposed to hate on white decks. It's got protection. It's got Hexper from white or protection from white. And plus two, plus oh, as long as it's attacking. It's great. Except it doesn't block well. Getting in for three doesn't matter against Baneslayer Angels and Lifelink creatures. Like getting getting them for three when they're gonna backswing for fifteen. Not very good. The best thing about Unchained Berserker was the fact that it lived through Definite Clarion. But it doesn't live through destroy effect. Like it's supposed to be anti white and it's just not good at it. And then another good example would be I can't remember the name of it because the only copies I have are in another language. I remember what it does. The Renown Scab Clan thing, I can't remember its name, the 3-drop 2-2. Two -two. I know it's not Scab Clan Mauler, because that was the one I played with in original Ravnica Standard. 
but like it's it's a two two that becomes a three three and then it turns into like a better idol on of the great rebel you want to know what's better than that card idol on of the great rebel because if you need to beat those kinds of cards you just need to beat all the cheap spells you just need to kill them I would rather have Eidolon of the Great Rebel than the, than that renowned Scab Clan any day. And then last but not least are cards that are typically and easily answered by cards that people already play in main decks. A really good example is if you're playing a, playing a deck where they're going to want Kulligan's Command against you anyway. Uh, you know, you're both trying to play fair and they have some graveyard synergy. You don't want Graft Digger's Cage. You want Leyline. But more than that, there's a slew of quote unquote disruption creatures. A really good example is something like Yixlid Jailer that just dies to like every removal spell, even though it shuts off all the graveyards. Which is great. Like cards in graveyards lose all abilities. That's fine. They can't flashback Lava Dart, but they can still gut shot it. Get it out of the way. Then flashback the Lava Dart. And kill you anyway. You know, Jailer says cards in graveyards lose all abilities. Well, they can conflagrate for two and a red. Kill your Jailer. And now the conflagrates in the graveyard where they wanted it. <laughs> like, it just doesn't do enough. And it's easily answered by cards they're already playing. And that's really kind of the crux of the issue. It's why I tend to steer clear of overly hating someone out. But if a particular matchup's giving you trouble... Or if the format you're playing in, whether it's the position on the ladder, the particular MTGO leagues you've been running into, or just your local metagame, is getting a little bit too inbred, you're starting to see a whole lot of the same thing, you can do a lot worse than just telling everybody, no, that's not what this game is going to be about. And with that, you can find me on Twitter, at HomewardPathMTG. You can find me on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain. My Facebook page has been becoming increasingly political, and I do not apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry. I do not apologize for that whatsoever. Uh, there's, there's way too much going on for me to try too hard to keep things escapee. Escapee. But... You, you 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 get the the left field I'm coming out of. Uh, you can join the Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. You can don't forget to join the construct the Easy Game Media Discord. I'm Adam HWP in there, and of course, if you're a patron of the show, you also gain access to the Patron Pathfinders Discord. If we get enough people in there, I want to start doing some kind of a of a of a patron tournament series on Arena. But we got to get some more bodies in there. I want to play Magic with y'all. And in particular, I love playing Magic with the people who have told me they respect my opinions on the game. <laughs> I want to play Magic with everybody, but like... The ones who have been forthcoming and telling me that they support what I'm doing, I want to, I want to thank them by playing Magic with them. I love the experience of playing Magic. And speaking of his experiences, everybody loves. We got, I uh, say everybody, it's really, a, it's a really strong word. We've got this week's rendition of hashtag MTG Dad Jokes. Uh, Brian Sharp <laughs> is a regular entrant. <coughs> Excuse me. Tagged me in a post along with several other people about Morag, Fury of Akum, the one that every time a land falls, you get all your creatures untapped, 
and you get an extra combat phase after this current phase. And then playing Morog with Scape Shift and Field of the Dead. So that you can get a lot of landfall triggers, make a bunch of zombies, and then be able to attack with them repeatedly. Well, that's cool. I said, well, it needs a haste enabler, and then we'll be making people furious. Leave behind a field of the dead in your wake? I'll see myself out. To which Brian replied, said, I know the strategy is out of left field, and it might, land, it might not landfall on its feet, but it might shift my local meta. He picked up what I was laying down, and I'm here for it. Last but not least, Brian again. The question was posted, said, what are your top three songs that go down well in every party ever? Uh, Scott says Africa by Toto, Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel, and September by Earth, Wind, and Fire, which, by the way, I love all of those songs. But then Brian fired in. Party Rock Anthem, The Warrior, Invisible Touch, because it's a rogue, Pinball Wizard, I mean, we can do worse. <laughs> Have the time war born slippy, bust a move. Oh, let's see what else we got down in here. Somebody else had to buy in. Uh, come on, somebody. Somebody really needs to give me the... Uh, Somebody needs to give me a cleric one because I couldn't find one. Which is actually not all that different than trying to find a cleric for your adventuring party on basically every game that asks about it. Anyway, that's all I got for this week, everybody. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back next week. I'm not dead sure what we're going to talk about. But in, in breaking with my more recent traditions... I have a different message at the end of this episode from now until November 3rd. I didn't want to become political about really anything, if I could help it. But this country stands on the precipice of a threat unlike any it has seen. Because this threat comes from inside. And I can only urge everybody... Look very carefully at all of the candidates on your ballot and make the right choice. Vote the issue, not the party. Vote the person, not the party. Make an educated and informed decision come election day. Please. So get out there. Rock the vote. Be safe, and I'll catch you next week.